Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Rodale, Rodale Institute's uh, webinar on organic control strategies for swine parasites in organic pastured pork systems. My name is Rick Carr. I'm the farm director at Rodale Institute, and I'm joined here uh, by my colleague, Sarah Major, research te technician, who's been spending a lot of time uh, on this subject. Uh, we're going to co-present this. And um, I want to let everyone know that the uh, recorded version of this presentation of this webinar is going to be emailed to all registered participants. Um, we will be delivering the presentation in full and then um, allowing um, several minutes for question and answer. And to do so, uh, please use the chat function for your questions, and then we'll address them at the end. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Sarah, who is going to deliver um, the beginning of the presentation. Thank you, Rick. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, putting pigs on pasture and sort of why we have chosen to do that. Um, the first reason is improved animal welfare. Um, somewhere between 95 and 97 percent of pigs in the United States raised for meat are raised in indoor confinement operations. Um, and pigs raised in these um, conditions are sort of prone to um, chronic stress. Um, they have higher levels of cortisone, which is or cortisol, which is the stress hormone, um, and they're more prone to aggression, um, tail biting and fighting than pigs that are raised outdoors. Pigs raised outdoors are able to express natural behaviors like foraging, rooting and wallowing, um, and they exhibit much fewer um, indications of chronic stress. Additionally, uh, pasture-raised pork commands premium pricing. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a table from the USDA National Monthly Pasture-Raised Pork Report. Um, they release this every month. This data is from September of 2022. Um, and as you can see, a tender, uh, the table is showing the average price per pound of pasture-raised pork, um, the average price per pound of commodity pork, which is the kind of pork that you would find at the grocery store. Um, and then all the way to the right is the pasture-raised premium, which is the difference between those two prices. Um, so that is how much more per pound you can get for each cut of meat. Um, so the tenderloin um, gets $12.09 more per pound than um, commodity pork. Bacon is almost $5 at $4.84. Um, Chops are over $8 and ground pork is um, about $4.17. Um, so that's a pretty good incentive for um, farmers to also raise pigs on pasture, um, getting a better price for the pork and raising pigs in a more humane way. However, pigs raising pigs organically and outdoors um, comes with its own challenge of swine parasites. Um, gastrointestinal parasites reduce the productivity of infected pigs by reducing the growth rate um, and causing poor feed efficiency, um, which results in economic losses to farmers. Pigs that have parasites living in their guts, um, those parasites are basically eating what the pig is eating. So feed that is supposed to be going to growing the pig is instead going to growing worms. Um, so it's costing more money to raise those pigs um, and makes it a little harder for things to be profitable. Um, Parasites can occur in all production systems. However, organic and pasture raised pigs are more likely to be infected with parasites and can be infected with a greater diversity of parasite species. Conventional operations in order to avoid parasites employ regular chemical prophylaxis, which means that they are routinely giving their pigs synthetic dewormers like fenbendazole and ivermectin. Um, this is pretty effective at keeping parasites out of the system. However, this overuse of synthetic dewormers has resulted in a lot of um, dewormer resistant worms, uh, similar to antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Um, so a lot of parasite species are getting harder to treat. This is also not an option in organic um, operations because synthetic dewormers are not permitted in growing stock. Um, the only synthetic dewormer allowed in organic swine is fenbendazole, which is the active ingredient in Safeguard, and that's only allowed in breeding sows up to the last third of gestation. So pigs that are destined for slaughter and to be sold as organic meat can never be given um, any sort of synthetic dewormer. A lot of farmers instead use natural or herbal methods like garlic, uh, black walnut, pumpkin seeds, diatomaceous earth, and apple cider vinegar to try to combat swine parasites. However, there's very little research available on whether or not these methods are effective. 
Next, I'm going to go into the three most common um, gastrointestinal swine parasite species um, in the United States. First, starting with Ocevagosimum, which is the nodular worm. Um, the life cycle of this parasite begins with eggs being passed in the feces. Um, those eggs are released out on pasture. Um, a worm develops inside the egg over the course of about a week, and a larva hatches out on pasture. Um, it go undergoes two molts and becomes the infective stage three larva. And if this larva is ingested by a pig, um, it goes to the large intestine, burrows into the wall of the intestine, and then when it completes, um, when it's finished growing, the adults emerge from the wall of the intestine and live and reproduce in the lumen or kind of the, the center of the intestine. The pre-patent period, which is the period between when the pig ingests that infective larva and when the worms begin releasing eggs in the feces is 20 to 40 days. Um, and this is pretty important because that's 20 to 40 days when a pig is infected with the worm, but um, it can't be detected by doing a fecal egg count. A little more information about the nodular worm. Um, the infective larvae can survive on pasture for about a year. Um, and one female worm can lay up to 5,000 eggs per day. The larvae burrowing in the intestinal wall um, can leave nodules of scar tissue, um, which would result in those intestines being condemned at slaughter. Intestines are sometimes used as natural sausage casings, um, so that can be kind of an additional economic loss. Infections with Ocevagosimum are generally asymptomatic. However, um, pigs only develop uh, moderate immunity to these infections, so reinfection is really common. Um, symptoms can include poor weight gain, um, diarrhea, and anorexia, so pigs not wanting to eat, but the infections are generally asymptomatic. Next, we have a scarisuum, which is the large intestinal roundworm. Again, the life cycle begins with eggs being passed in the feces. Um, they undergo development over the course of about two to six weeks on pasture, and inside that egg, um, a second stage larva develops, and this is the infective stage. So if those infective eggs are ingested, um, the eggs hatch in the small intestine, and then the larvae undergo um, a pretty complex cycle just to end up back in the small intestine. So first they travel to the liver through the bile duct, um, from the liver to the lungs via either the circulatory or lymphatic vessels, um, and when they're finished uh, developing in the lungs, they're either coughed up and swallowed or migrate up the windpipe and down into the stomach um, to again, end up as adults living and reproducing in the small intestine. Pre-patent period, which is again the period between when the infection begins and when eggs begin to be released in the feces is 40 to 50 days. Female worms of a scarisum can lay up to 200,000 eggs per day, and those eggs can remain viable in the soil for up to 11 years. So once these eggs are in a system, um, it's really difficult to get rid of them. They, uh, the eggs have a very thick shell, which allows them to resist um, desiccation or drying out, um, different levels of UV light. Um, it's really difficult to destroy these eggs and get rid of them out of a system, out of a pasture um, once they're there. The larvae traveling through the liver can result in granulomas or milk spots, which you can see in the liver in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and this would result in the livers being condemned at slaughter, which is again, another additional um, economic loss. Infections with the scare soon can cause poor weight gain and diarrhea, pneumonia from the larvae being in the lungs. And these worms can grow up to um, 16 inches long. And because they're so large, um, they can actually cause intestinal blockages, which can result in death. Pigs develop um, some immunity to Ascarisuum, a better immune response than they do for Ossifagosimum. However, reinfection is possible. And finally, we have Trichurus suis, which is the swine whipworm. Um, once again, eggs are passed in the feces and a first stage larva develops in the egg out on pasture over the course of 15 to 30 days. Um, if those eggs are ingested, they hatch in the large intestine um, adult worms develop and they actually attach to the mucosal lining of the large intestine. And the pre-patent period of Trichurus suis is 60 to 70 days. Female worms of Trichurus suis lay between 5,000 and 20,000 eggs per day, and these eggs can remain viable for three to four years in soil. So not quite as long as the scarisum, but still a pretty significant period of time. Um, allowing a pasture to rest just one or two years might not be long enough for those eggs to be completely gone before putting pigs back out on the same pasture. Infections with Trichurus suis can cause anorexia, um, anemia, bloody diarrhea, dehydration, and death. Um, 
but luckily pigs can develop a pretty effective immune response to infections with triterosuis and reinfection with triterosuis is extremely rare. Next, I'm going to be talking about um, a previous grant that um, we had funded by the USDA NEFA Organic Transitions Grant um, Program titled Manure and Pasture Management to Reduce Swine Parasites in Organic Pastured Pork Production. This project we did in collaboration with Dr. Alex Hernandez at Kutztown University and Dr. Yushi Lee at the University of Minnesota. Um, it had four research objectives. The first was to evaluate parasite prevalence on organic pig farms. The second was to determine the effectiveness of manure composting on eliminating swine parasites and its underlying mechanisms. The third was to assess biofumigation as an approach to swine parasite control in pastures. And finally, we wanted to determine the effects of grazing those biofumigation pastures by organic pigs on reducing swine parasite contamination. So as I mentioned, objective one was to evaluate parasite prevalence on organic pig farms. And to do that, we conducted field surveys um, at organic and pasture raised pig farms in Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. These states are home to about 30% of the nation's organic pig farms and are the source of over 60% of national organic pork sales. The criteria for participating farms was that they had to be organic um, alternative, which means that they may not be organically certified, but they follow organic practices and pigs had to have outdoor access. Pigs had to have bedded floors, um, no slatted floors or confinement, and most importantly, no synthetic or non-organically approved dewormers were allowed to be used. Um, on these nine farms, we collected fecal bedding and soil samples and analyzed them for the presence of parasite eggs. Um, the fecal samples that we collected from the pigs um, were categorized based on the age of the pigs. Uh, breeder pigs were gestating sows of all parodies. Feeder pigs were two to four months old and then finishing pigs were from five months to market weight. And before I go into our results, um, just a couple of terms that I'm gonna be using. Um, the prevalence of an infection is the proportion of infected individuals among all individuals examined. This is usually reported as a percentage um, and mean intensity is the average number of parasite individuals in an infected host. So first we have a graph um, just showing the prevalence of parasite infections on all nine farms um, based on the farm and state. Um, and as you can see, every single farm that we sampled had at least one, or sorry, had some level of parasite infection in their pigs. Um, and on eight of nine farms, parasite prevalence was greater than 50%, which means that more than half of their pigs were infected with parasites. Um, this is kind of the first survey of its kind, um, looking at organic farms and um, alternative farms in the US. So this is really novel information. Um, and it is showing that parasites are a pretty uh, pervasive problem for these farmers. Next, we have a graph showing the prevalence of infections by parasite species. Um, Ascarosuum was the most prevalent species with um, just under 50% of infected pigs being infected with Ascarosuum and Ossifagosmum and Trichurosuis um, infected about 25% of pigs. <clears throat> Breaking down the prevalence a little more um, based on the, the host or the pig's age group and the species of parasite, um, Finisher pigs were mostly infected with Ossifagosmum and Ascarosuum. Breeder pigs um, were also mostly infected with Ossifagosmum. They had much lower infection rates in, with Ascarosuum and Trichurosuis. And feeder pigs um, were mostly infected with Ascarosuum and were the ones that were most infected with Trichurosuis out of the three age groups. And finally, we have the mean intensity. Um, of parasite infection in different age groups by species. So this is the um, average eggs per gram of feces um, of the pigs. Um, and in this, you can see that Ascarosuum had significantly more um, eggs per grams of feces um, than the other two parasite species, which is to be expected because as I mentioned earlier, Ascaris uh, female worms can release over 200,000 eggs per day, whereas the other two species are between five and 20,000. The intensity was significantly higher in feeder and finisher pigs for Ascarosuum than breeder pigs, um, as well as for Ossifagosimum. Um, 
I'm sorry, Ocifagosimum had higher intensity in finisher and breeder pigs, and Trichurosuis was pretty consistent um, in the three species, or I'm sorry, the three age groups. Um, next, Rick Carr is going to be discussing objective two. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, so, uh, for managing manure in, um, say, a pork operation or dairy operation, um, there's a few different types. Uh, you have um, you, you have your liquid manure, uh, as you commonly find in uh, dairy barns, uh, but then in a lot of other barns, overwintering animals, uh, what you do is you just pack it with um, you're constantly adding um, straw. And so you develop this bed pack. And in both types, um, you know, your solid bed pack and your liquid manure uh, to dispose of it, you're putting that back on the fields as uh, nutrients. And so what Sarah had just mentioned is that if uh, we're detecting uh, parasites, the eggs in the bed pack, um, we can be putting that back onto our fields where the pigs will eventually graze and then become reinfected. So what we wanted to explore is, uh, can we compost it and destroy that? And um, what we have at Rodale Institute, this image here is uh, the compost operation at Rodale Institute. And so for me, it was low hanging fruit uh, in studying uh, composting, swine bed pack manure to destroy uh, parasites because we know it works with plant pathogens, including nematodes. Uh, and we know it works to destroy weed seeds, uh, but nobody's ever examined it for uh, swine parasites. So everything was conducted at uh, Rodale Institute's large scale composting operation. And to study this, what we did is we had twice, twice a year, we bedded the, uh, the stalls where the pigs were living and created that bed pack over six months or so. And then um, either in the spring or the uh, spring or the fall or more of summer and winter, we removed all the contents and measured uh, the swine parasites before uh, composting and then weekly during composting uh, to see if we can detect any parasites. Now the National Organic Program has rules for composting manure, uh, and they state that um, the compost and windrow, windrow turning systems like this, the compost must maintain temperatures between 131 and 170 degrees for 15 consecutive days, during which time the compost piles must be turned a minimum of five times. And so I set out to achieve those um, rules for both uh, times of the year when we were composting the bed pack. And I'm gonna show you the results. Okay, this uh, first set of figures here on the top is the temperature data. Uh, I have little uh, digital data loggers that are measuring the temperature uh, every four hours. And um, I would be downloading that afterwards. And so, um, the solid black bar is the compost pile temperature. This is uh, an average of six different locations in the compost pile. And uh, the lighter gray bar uh, below it is the ambient air temperature that I was measuring as well. And what you could see kind of are these little red uh, points there. Those are turning events. And that um, those are the days that I turned it and you can kind of see on some of them turning and then the temperature drops and it comes back up. That's typical for compost piles. Uh, but then the yellow bar that's uh, around 60, that's the um, that's the National Organic Program rules. That's that temperature range that I'm supposed to be maintaining for 15 days. And now the lower bar is a, a log transfer of of the parasites that we were detecting. And so this one was done in the summer and I was able to maintain high temperatures for several weeks. And uh, what you could see is a decrease in the um, parasite load or the parasites detected uh, over time. Um, and which is, which is nice to see. It didn't happen as, as quickly as I would, I would expect. Um, but interestingly though, when I conducted this over the winter, 
Um, the, excuse me. Oh, this is the second one on the summer. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, we, a second uh, attempt in the summertime. Um, you can see the same type of graphs here, these figures. Uh, high temperatures uh, for uh, extended period of time, and we saw an immediate decrease in in parasite eggs that we were able to to detect. But doing this during the winter, um, I wasn't able to maintain those temperatures uh, for that time period. Uh, the piles uh, just weren't that large to be able to hold the temperature, and we were seeing some very uh, low temperatures in ambient air. As you can see where the actual pile temperature and the ambient air temperature are starting to match up uh, near the end of the trial. Uh, so this is, this is going through uh, January into February. And as we predicted that high temperatures could uh, possibly be the mechanism for destruction of parasite eggs, uh, since we didn't have the high temperatures, um, we didn't see a decrease, uh, a noticeable decrease in parasites. And when that was replicated, it was pretty similar um, overall trend, especially with the uh, Ascaris. Um, can't explain why we just weren't able to detect the Ostevagostimum and Tricurus, uh, but the Ascaris was still detectable after uh, the composting trial. So what we had tried doing uh, earlier this year is determine the mechanisms for uh, of, of why or how we're destroying the parasite eggs and particularly looking at um, different temperature regimes. And so subjecting parasite eggs to uh, different uh, temperatures and then the period of, of um, incubation. So for example, um, we were going after, say maybe we can do 170 degrees Fahrenheit for three days versus 15 days or 120 for 30 days. Um, not all compost is able to reach these high temperatures. So um, that's what we wanna explore to see what temperature regime is actually destroying the parasite eggs. And so the continuing uh, investigations that we have, uh, some of our ongoing research, we're gonna to continue to do this project as uh, this trial because um, it's just our standard protocol to compost our bed pack manure. And uh, I'll have Sarah go out there and take samples weekly and just keep repeating these trials to see if we can, um, you know, uh, make our, see if our results line up over time. Uh, but one thing that I didn't note is that I used only swine bed pack manure. I did not bulk it up. Uh, so the compost recipe was not ideal for the optimum composting conditions. Uh, it, the carbon and nitrogen ratio wasn't where it's supposed to be recommended, uh, say uh, one to 30 or 30 to one uh, or 25 to one. There's a certain range that uh, uh, the compost industry recommends for composting. And what it needed is more carbon. So say adding more straw or another carbon source like leaves um, that's what I'm going to be examining over time. And uh, another thing, uh, as funding permits, is to examine if there are other microbial activities that are occurring in the compost pile, not just temperature, uh, that could be destroying eggs. Uh, so um, what that is, is antibiosis. We know that there are bacteria that uh, release toxins, and um, could they be destroying um, some of these eggs. So we'll be looking at that as well. Now I'll turn it over to Sarah for biofumigation. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the last two objectives of our research project dealt with biofumigation. Biofumigation is the pest control strategy that uses gases naturally produced by plants, mostly in the Brassicaceae family, um, to fumigate or destroy pests in the soil. Um, Brassicas have compounds in their cells, and when um, they undergo tissue damage. Those compounds react with enzymes and produce a gas called isothiocyanate. Um, isothiocyanate is a derivative of cyanide gas. It's a highly toxic, volatile gas. Um, so it kills things in the soil, but it evaporates very quickly. Um, so in order to utilize this gas, um, farmers will chop up the um, 
the plants to um, initiate that tissue damage, um, create the uh, reaction between the compounds and the enzymes, and then pack the soil, pack the um, incorporate those plant residues into the soil, and then pack the soil down um, to try to trap the gas as long as possible. Um, this is mostly used um, to destroy uh, plant parasitic nematodes and plant pathogens. It hasn't really been studied for its effectiveness against swine parasites. Um, here are the results of a few studies looking at um, the effects of biofumigation on plant parasites. Um, so brown mustard and radish caused a significant reduction in the viability of potato cyst nematodes, <clears throat> potato cyst nematode eggs. Um, the defatted seed meals of radish, watercress, black mustard, and arugula caused significant reduction in tomato root knot nematode. And Bresca rapa, cauliflower, and watercress all suppressed uh, potato cyst nematodes. So there is um, some scientific evidence that it is effective against um, some nematodes that are parasitic of plants. However, again, it hasn't been studied um, on its effectiveness against swine parasites. Um, so for research objective four, which was again to determine the effects of grazing biofumigation pastures by organic pigs on reducing swine parasite contamination, we wanted to test the effects of rapeseed, which is a brassica, um, on parasite eggs in the pasture, as well as test um, mechanical versus biological incorporation of plant residues. Um, and what I mean by that is mechanical, um, that would be uh, flail mowing the plants to again initiate that tissue damage, um, mechanically spade the um, plant residues into the soil and pack them down with a cultipacker. Um, and that would be mechanical incorporation. Um, and for biological incorporation, we wanted to see if basically the pigs could do all the work um, by going out and foraging on the plants. Um, they would be creating that tissue damage and then um, sort of rooting around, incorporating those plant residues into the soil and trampling on top to pack the uh, plant residues into the soil. Our experimental design um, involved four fields, two of clover as a control. Um, clover isn't a brassica and it doesn't have any sort of biofumigation properties, um, and two with rapeseed. Um, half of, or I'm sorry, one of the clover fields um, was going to be grazed and then mechanically incorporated while the other was going to be only grazed, um, and that was the biological um, incorporation. Similarly with rapeseed, um, one half would be grazed and then mechanically incorporated, and half of it was not going to be mechanically incorporated after grazing. Um, each of the fields were split up into four paddocks, and each paddock was grazed for one week. Um, and this is showing the results of um, the parasite eggs that we detected in the soil throughout the course of the experiment. Um, we collected soil samples one week, um, or at the beginning of putting pigs out on a pasture, so that was um, kind of time point negative one. Uh, it was before pigs were out there, um, immediately before they went out. Um, and then after one week at time point zero, immediately when pigs were taken off. Um, and then after the pigs were taken off, we again either mechanically incorporated the plant residues or did not. Um, and then we collected soil samples for an additional three weeks. Um, and this is showing the number of eggs recovered um, over the course of that five week period. Um, as you can see by week three after um, taking the pigs off, all four pastures saw a reduction in parasite eggs um, and they all ended up around um, pretty close to zero eggs being detected. Um, and because we saw that reduction in the control fields as well as the experimental fields, um, it's difficult to tell whether that reduction was due to um, the rapeseed or not. Um, so essentially we can't say that um, the reduction that we saw in the rapeseed fields was due to the rapeseed because we saw that very similar um, reduction in eggs over time in the control pastures. Um, so at this time, our results would indicate that uh, biofumigation was not effective at reducing parasite eggs. However, um, in the future, it is something we want to continue studying and see if we can refine our experimental design um, to see if it is um, a viable option. Because at this point in time, um, as I mentioned earlier, those parasite eggs can persist in the in the soil for um, over a decade for a um, and there's not really much we can do to actually destroy the the uh, eggs in the pasture. Um, and those eggs are just there waiting to infect more pigs, which will re release more eggs out onto the pasture and infect more pigs in the future. Um, so this is definitely an area we want to continue studying and exploring 
Um, but at this point in time, uh, the results don't necessarily indicate that biofumigation is um, a good option. Um, we were also recently awarded um, a Northeastern SAIR partnership grant um, titled Optimized Management Practices to Reduce Swine Parasites in Organic Pig Farms. Um, and this project has two main objectives. The first is to evaluate parasite prevalence and intensity on organic and pasture raised pig farms by conducting a robust survey study. Um, this survey study is kind of similar to our previous survey study. Um, however, our previous study only took place in the summer of 2019 and this survey um, will take place um, over the course of a year every season. Um, so we'll get kind of a, a better understanding of how the parasites um, sort of act throughout the year and in different conditions. Um, and another way in which this survey is different from our last one is that we're going to analyze the effects of management practices on parasite infections. Um, so at each of the farms that we're visiting for this survey study, um, we are collecting data on how they manage their pigs, um, how frequently their pigs are moved, what plants they're being given access to, um, what type of outdoor access they have, um, a lot of different variables to see if there's any sort of management practice that makes pigs more or less prone to being infected with parasites. Some other research um, directions that we wanna go in the future are testing the, effic the efficacy of those natural entomentics or dewormers that I mentioned earlier, um, like garlic, diatomaceous earth, apple cider vinegar. Um, there's just not a lot of science to indicate whether or not these are effective at um, reducing or controlling parasites, um, but that's information that is really important to know because organic farmers don't really have very many options for um, parasite control. We also want to explore alternative forages and feeding regimens um, just to try to figure out the best ways to um, raise pigs on pasture. Thank you for joining us and please be sure to check out our website with all of our other webinars and educational opportunities that we have.